Hello, welcome back to Next Level Adventures and a new province. We are in Kanchanaburi, one of the most beautiful provinces in Thailand, and it's huge. In fact, Bangkok is not too far away, and yet there's only one province that separates this bridge and Chiang Mai Old Town. That's how big this province stretches. Now, it's full of beautiful nature. We will be exploring that in this video today. However, it's also home to a very interesting and somber human history. Now, obviously I'm not a professional historian, but I have visited the museum here. I visited the Hell Pass, which we'll see in this video. I watched some documentaries, I did some reading. I also spoke to some locals who live here just to put together some information and learn the history. And so I'm gonna condense that in this video, but it'll, it will be a refresher for most of you. But if it's brand new information, then I think you'll really uh, enjoy it because not only will you learn something, but you'll get some context to you know, the beautiful nature we're gonna see, but also how a lot of this province was built on blood of some prisoners of war. What happened, why, we'll reveal all in this video. I think it's important to tell the story. So relax and enjoy as we get to know and discover the beautiful nature, yet somber history of Kanchanaburi. Let's go. Context is very important, I believe, and we could start the story in 1942 when the Japanese invaded Southeast Asia and they made this bridge. However, before we get to that point, I think it's important to understand the mindset of the Japanese soldiers. So let's go back to the 20s when they became a new emperor in Japan, Emperor Hirohito. And he, over the years, became more than an emperor, just similarly, actually, to Rama IX here in Thailand. Living in Thailand during his reign, I really started to understand that he kind of transcended monarchy. He was more than a king. He kind of was considered a god in some ways. And at the time in Japan, in the 20s and 30s, Hirohito had transcended emperor and was almost looked upon as a god-like figure. And so the soldiers were trained to not only protect the king and protect the flag, but to treat the emperor, their reign leader, as almost like a god-like figure. It's also important to understand that the Japanese soldiers were trained in a very harsh way. Not only did they have to protect their country, their flag, their king, and their god as he was transcending into but they had to be trained to believe that certain things were just a no-go and the biggest disrespect to the king the emperor the flag in the country was surrender absolutely no under no circumstances could you surrender there would be no more bigger disrespect to your country and to the emperor than surrendering obviously Kamikaze is a great example of the Japanese soldiers. They would rather crash their burning jet into a battleship and explode into certain death than limp away and try and crash and land safely and be captured. That is an absolute no-go. They would obviously kamikaze. And so surrendering was just an absolute no-no. And that's important to remember because later on in the story when they were building this and using prisoners of war, that mindset um, really impacted them. Uh, they looked upon the soldiers who did surrender and who were prisoners of war in such disregard. So it's important to understand the mindset of the Japanese soldiers and how they treated prisoners of war and people who had surrendered to them. And also, and most importantly, that in 1929, the Japanese declined to sign the Geneva Conventions, which basically meant that they were not signing to the rules of combat, the rules of war. And that basically let them get away with treating prisoners of war how they wanted without any human humanity with no real sanitation and just to treat them however they wanted and obviously they didn't look too kindly upon prisoners and people who had surrendered so this is a cocktail that later on in the 40s when they do decide to invade as we'll talk about now that that led to the mindset and the environment for mass torture on these poor soldiers who had surrendered now why did they surrender how did they surrender it's an important story let me tell you So let's fast forward to the 1940s now and the Japanese Emperor Hirohito, he sets his target on expansion. He sees an opportunity for Japan to spread her wings and to expand her empire. And in 1942, they set upon a two-stage attack. 
a very violent uh, surprise attack in Pearl Harbor. Obviously, we all know what happened there. And on the very next day, they made landfall in southern Thailand and Malaysia with their sights set upon taking the bounty that laid before them here in Southeast Asia. Obviously, Myanmar and Thailand is a basin for growing rice and vegetables and a great staple to supply their future empire. And Malaysia was very rich with rubber and tin and other metals. And the Dutch Indies, which is called Indonesia now, was very rich and still is in oil. So they knew that they could, if they, if they could just grab their hands on Southeast Asia, they could control a lot of land and supply and precious materials. Southeast Asia was there for the taking. The only problem was the impenetrable uh, British fortress state of Singapore. Now the main problem with Singapore was it had a reputation as this fortress and it was completely impenetrable. However, it was extremely weakened and the Japanese knew that. After all, the British were busy fighting Nazi Germany over in Europe and a large section of the Southeast Asian British fleet were over in Europe dealing with that. Also, the British hadn't done a very good job at securing the northern borders of Singapore. They never assumed that anybody would try and would be brave enough, brash enough, to do a land invasion through the Malaysian jungle. They just assumed no one would ever do that, and the Japanese knew that. So when they landed in southern Thailand, they came through uh, Malaysia and southern Thailand, and they made their way to Singapore, and they had a battle. It was quite short-lived, and the British surrendered, and it was the most embarrassing biggest defeat in the British Empire's history. Our stronghold in Southeast Asia was gone. The Japanese had invaded and the British quickly signed a surrender form. And that was the beginning of the end for those soldiers, not just the British, but the Dutch, the Americans, all of the allied forces that were in that region who had surrendered under this direct order from Winston Churchill and the Navy were now doomed because the Japanese were in control of them and they didn't seem to really like people who surrendered and they had an idea for how to put them to work. The Japanese wasted absolutely no time asserting their authority by sadly massacring the civilian Chinese population in Singapore. They looked at them as potential spies, communists and all that kind of thing and the British and Allied forces who had surrendered were tasked by burying the dead. Anybody who tried to escape was tortured or killed as well. And very quickly, things got sour. Now, the Japanese didn't just want to hold the soldiers there. Um, they did for a while, and starvation and diarrhea started an infection, and they were tre terribly in Singapore. But they were promised better, a better life, if you want to call it that, uh, further up into the continent in Thailand, because Japan had a problem. You see, they were trying to expand, they were trying to secure a base, and one of their biggest areas of prominence was in the city of Yangon, which at the time I think was called Ragoon in Myanmar. Uh, however, the supply chain and supply lines that they needed to resupply food and ammunition to their soldiers from Bangkok was a really long journey around the peninsula and uh, by boat, obviously, and they couldn't do it by air. They were getting shot down by the British and the Allied jets and planes. And the submarines and frigates were sinking the Japanese uh, resupply routes because I think that was the only thing that the Allied forces could do at the time. The Thais had already just put their hands up and said we don't want to get involved please you know we know we're not interested in fighting the Japanese they'd seen what had happened in Pearl Harbor and they were outnumbered and outgunned so the, the Thai people were just kind of occupied at the time not really getting involved and the British and the Allied forces well they were fighting Germany and it must have been such a confusing difficult time to be fighting a superpower in Europe and having another superpower emerging and causing havoc on the other side of the world. So I think sending frigates and a few planes to, to disrupt the uh, Japanese resupply route was their only best bet. And so the Japanese got so frustrated that they decided that the only thing they could do was to build a train line from Bangkok all the way through Kanchanaburi into the border across into Myanmar. Now I've traveled around this part of Thailand on my little Honda motorbike into Tak and Kanchanaburi and it is just thick rainforest with mountains, rivers and I mean back in the day before modern 
uh, engineering and having JCBs and cranes and everything to just clear the forest, it, it would have been a mammoth task. In fact, the British had thought about building a train line in a similar position, but they decided that it was way too difficult and they just abandoned it. But the Japanese thought that was their only option. A difficult, painstaking, painful build of a train track that thankfully was made a lot easier to them because they had thousands and thousands of prisoners of war that they could put to work. And in 1942, they started the train line and they started this bridge. And that's where all of the bloodshed started. Okay, so we're here now at the Hellfire Pass, deep in the jungle of Kanchanaburi, and we're gonna make our way down to take a closer look at a very interesting part of the train track in a moment. But as you arrive at the Hellfire Pass, you will experience a fantastic museum. It's funded by the Australian government, so inside it's absolutely fantastic. The staff speak incredibly good English, and the information is displayed in a very tasteful, modern, and very clear to understand way. And once you go through that area of the museum, you start to make your way along down to where we're gonna see where one of the most brutal parts of the train line was built in. And we'll be able to learn a little bit more about what these, not just prisoners of war, but also by this point, when they'd gotten up here, the Japanese had uh, enrolled Thais, Burmese, uh, Malaysians, um, everybody in the region here. And uh, obviously they were getting paid a pittance and uh, getting worked really hard as well but obviously the prisoners of war were getting it much worse obviously no pay and barely any food in fact just before we go down to see the hellfire pass one of the most poignant things inside the museum was they had a depiction of the amount of rock that was expected to be moved by one prisoner of war in one day compared to a tiny bowl of a minuscule portion of rice that they were given as a ration for that day so that much food for that much work and they basically had to feed themselves with whatever they could find out here in the jungle, reptiles, bugs, eggs, whatever they could find and scavenge when they weren't working 22 hours a day, sometimes 33 hours in a row, 150 days in a row. Uh, the museum's fantastic and it's prepared me with knowledge and um, a little bit of dread to go down and see the conditions and what they were expected to do here at the Hellfire Pass. So in mid-1943, the Japanese shifted gear under pressure from their superiors. They went into a mode called Speedo. They really wanted to get this train line finished and so they stepped up the gear. They worked through the night, through the day, and this is where it turned into a hellish place. Cracking these walls, trying to blast through with pick forks and whatever else they were given, and worked worked through the night and through the day and on minimal rations this was the part of the, the track that reminisced of the most of hell and that's why it is called hellfire pass and it's it's somber and you can just imagine with the bamboo fires and the cracking of the whips how how hellish this must have been and uh, again the australian government have done a fantastic job here with the flags and the memorials the audiobook that you can listen to as well yeah just a fantastic uh, place of memory, but also it's gut-wrenching if you think about it, if you try and envision what it must have been like here. It's heavy stuff, but this is an important part of Thai history, an important part of this province. And uh, yeah, I hope you're enjoying this slice of history. It's very strange to see a British flag and Allied forces flags 
in the middle of the Thai jungle. I mean, you can hear all the bugs. You can just imagine what it must have been like to being here every single day in the blaring heat with no food and water or barely any food and water and all this going on. It must have been miserable. And that's putting it lightly, obviously. Okay, so I'm gonna end the video here. Originally, I wanted it to be a longer video with two sections. The first section, learning about the railway and sharing with you what I had learned. And then coming over to Erwin Falls, the beautiful nature and staying here on the river. And um, I just think, I, I, as I was editing there, I got to this point, it's already 15 minutes or so. And I just think that piece of content, that video you've just seen, this video, um, should just live on my channel by itself. I think it doesn't, we don't need to attach a really fun, happy section of the video. We can save that for the next one. I just hope you found this video useful. Like I said, I'm not an historian, um, but I just tried to, in my own words, and through the source material that I found and read about, not only in the museums, but on YouTube, the visions, the footage I should say that you saw during this video, I will link that documentary below. You should watch that, you should come visit the museums, go to the Hellfire Pass and um, learn some more. Um, there's so much more to this story, I could never condense it all obviously into a 15 minute video. But I just wanted to give you a little glimpse to the story and what I felt as I was there. So I just, having visited many of the provinces, thought that it deserved its own video and its own story and we didn't need to bookmark it with some jumping in waterfalls and having a great time. That'll save that for the next one. Anyway, see you in the next one.